And now, Traffic, traffic. with Diana O'Lea. Which is taking a peek at your drive coming out of Goleta, trying to work your way into Santa Barbara. That is a beautiful stretch on that 101 heading southbound right now and moving along nicely into Summerlin through Toro Canyon. Normally, we do have a bit of slowing through Carpentry on that northbound side of the 101, but this morning it's been super quiet. It looks wonderful leaving the 150. So, kind of a holiday light ride for Juneteenth, and it looks great getting into Toro Canyon, moving on into Summerlin. There's just a small pocket of slowing at a at the moment on the 118 heading eastbound, and that is from Vineyard to Rose Avenue. Traffic is sponsored by SaveOurWater.com. California is in its third year of severe drought. Now more than ever, we need to save water. You can help by limiting your outdoor water use and switching to low water plants. For water saving tips, visit SaveOurWater.com. Save water, save California. That's traffic. I'm Diana Olea, News Talk 1590, KVTA. Now, let's get back to the KVTA Morning Show. What kind of a cut, cut rate production is this? A new stop. 1590 KVTA. And we're going to get to Cal State University Channel Islands in just a moment. But, Debbie, good morning. Good morning, Ken. How you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing great. I'll speak for the group. Everybody's doing good. So you won tickets for the Surf Rodeo? Will this be your yes. first time? I'm so excited. Is this your first time? Yes. Okay, well, it's going to be fun. We're all going to try to get out there. That is my birthday weekend, by the way. Oh, it is? Yes. How old are you? I like Guinness. <laughs> That's all you need to know. Okay. <laughs> Everything else is just details. Yeah, I like, okay. I like Guinness. All right, so maybe we'll catch you there Friday, and that Friday will be July 15th. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Big win and win. Yes, it was. Thank you sure for calling in, Debbie. So now let's move on over to the phones, and we bring on from Cal State University Channel Islands. It looks, do we have them? Uh, one second, Spencer. I think they're calling back. They're calling back right now. Stand by. Okay, we're going to get uh, this uh, phone machine working here on News Talk 1590 KVTA, and we will have environmental scientist Dr. Sean Anderson going to talk about the crazy stuff going on with our climate, uh, the drought, and the climate central uh, climate change report that's uh, coming up here. So uh, do we have uh, Sean on now? Hey, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Hey, great to have you. Long, long time no here. I, I, I heard it was your birthday, and you like did it, and then I dropped off. So I thought, oh, my God, I, I, I learned the secret to to the, uh, the the Ventura greatness, but I guess not. Yeah, we, we need uh, we need Guinness. That's all we need is Guinness. <laughs> that, that is the rule. And do we also have Kim along with us? Yeah, you have Kim. Hi, this is Kim. Kim and him. All right. Well, let's start <laughs> off with environmental Kim scientists. And- Dr. Sean Anderson, we're going to talk about all the stuff going on with the climate, the drought, and all of that. So first up, uh, let's go with this, doctor. Can you remind us all what you teach at Cal State Channel Islands? What are your subjects? Yeah, I teach, I teach too much. I teach uh, all aspects of how we manage our, our coast, the, the greater coastal zone. I teach my students how to do um, effective research. We do mostly applied stuff at our school. So we study things like disasters, um, how to restore coastal wetlands, things of that nature. So what is the Climate Central Climate Change Report, and why is this so significant? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is a new report that just came out last week, and this is um, a a nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, group that helps journalists better understand issues of the day. And in this case, they just came out with a new peer-reviewed uh, study that looked at um, our coastal wetlands. So our wetlands um, are really valuable things across the planet. But particularly here in California, we've had a problem. We've lost 91% of the wetlands that used to exist here um, from the time we, we became a state till now. Um, and our coastal wetlands, are even there's even uh, fewer of those. So these are the wetlands that, that hug the coast. So think of Magoo Lagoon, think of the estuary at Santa Clara River Mouth, that kind of stuff. Um, And what this reports, and so the issue is, uh, one of the most obvious ones is we have a sea level rise thing happening, right? With with, uh, there's there's existing background rising of the seas that that, that sort of was going on without people. But then we, because we've been pumping all these these carbon dioxide, these methanes, all these gases in the air, we're actually... um, heating up the earth, and one of the consequences is the, the sea level is rising. So right now, we've experienced about a foot more, the, the, the tides right now on average are about a foot higher in Ventura than they would have been had we not been doing this. And our models all show conservatively, at least we're, we're looking at probably about a meter rise by the end of the century. And so what that means is 
um, our wetlands are going to get more flooded, right? They're going to get they're going to get inundated. And so the study from from uh, climate the climate central folks looked at is, hey, are we screwed in terms of our coastal wetlands, or are we not screwed? We have choices to make, both in terms of emissions, but also in terms of how we deal with. Um, allowing those wetlands to retreat farther up onto land, uh, what we would now consider onto land, but will, will soon be um, the coastline. So what their study shows is that um, if we take uh, effective measures in places like California, we can expand our coastal wetlands. If we don't, if we do nothing, if we if we leave these hard lines in place, not allow wetlands to, to migrate on upward, and we continue our emission scenario, we're looking at something like perhaps the vast majority of our coastal wetlands across the U.S. Are going away. Now, who writes the report, Doctor? Oh, great question. So, so in these cases, they they contract out different scientists um, from different different labs around the country, um, and it's, a, it's not a typical model. So, so oftentimes um, these types of news organizations, the, the journalists themselves, let's say, would do, or, or, or the the folks working for the think tank would do the study. In this case, these folks have um, uh, basically hired experts that already do this modeling and said, hey, can you, can you do this? Um, can you essentially take these large-scale um, findings that have been vetted by hundreds and thousands of scientists, but can you drill them down into our local area? In our case, this is, these are the coastlines. So here in Ventura, and one of the cool things is with the, the Climate Central Report is you can go to the website and you can play around with a bunch of stuff. You can say, do you think we're going to be lucky? Do you think we're not going to be lucky? Do I want to say a conservative uh, emission scenario, a liberal emission scenario. So you can you can play with all the the factors. So the neat thing about this study is it doesn't say what exactly is going to happen, but it helps us frame the challenges. So it says, you know, the worst possible thing could be X, the best possible thing could be Y, and it allows us to have discussion. So for example, in Ventura, if we if we do um, all the the least optimal things, we'll lose, in Ventura County specifically, we'll lose about 46% of our coastal wetlands, whereas um, if we do all the idealized things that we probably can't, we could actually grow our wetlands to almost 83%. So it, it, sometimes when we do these studies, people are like, oh my God, the world's ending, oh my God, the life's over, and here's the evidence. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to show the option. Say, hey, let's have an informed discussion, and not say what's going to happen, but sort of, again, more provide sort of sideboards. And this is what um, is likely to happen. It's going to be somewhere in between these ranges, so we can have a like you know informed conversation. And doctor, just so you know, I only need the world for about twenty more years. <laughs> so how am I, I looking? Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's like how much Guinness can you drink in twenty years? It's a challenge. <laughs> it is a challenge, and I'm willing to take it on. So let's talk about uh, the coasts and beaches. One of the interesting things during the pandemic, the outdoors became literally yeah. the great outdoors, and everybody oh. wanted to get to the beach. Did we treat the beach okay with this inundation of folk? It's a great question. So um, we've actually been studying that specifically. So um, what we found is, um, now remember, initially, early on in the pandemic, um, it was, oh, my God, uh, stuff's horrible. You know, let's, let's stay away from folks because we you know, understandably don't want to spread this disease, et cetera. And initially, people said, hey, let's go, out to the, let's go outdoors. And one of the classic places for us in Southern California, the outdoors means the beach, right, for a, a large fraction of folks. So a lot of people ran to the beaches. Then fairly quickly, um, spurred by Los Angeles County, we said, oh, actually, no, don't go to the beaches. The beaches are dangerous. They were worried people were congregating. What we know now is that, that, what, that, that there's a, some risk, of course, but, but um, relatively minor risk um, from being outdoors. Um, but as a consequence, we shut down access to the beach, and it was really, really interesting. So, so when when um, we first shut down access to the beach in Los Angeles County, we got a bunch of folks that came over to Ventura County, for example, and it just showed the inelastic demand um, for the outdoors. And when people want to go to the outdoors, specifically our coastlines and our beaches, they want to go there. And if they can't get that access because they can't find parking in Malibu or because some restriction says this beach is closed, they're going to go, they'll go pretty far to access the beach. And so what we saw is huge numbers, massive spikes. And indeed, in some cases, we saw upwards of 400 or 500 percent the number of people that would normally be at a beach, say, on a on a April weekend or something um, um, at at our beaches. And so there was huge numbers of folks. So that led to more trash into that. Initially, we saw that very clearly in the spike in COVID-related trash, specifically masks and 
and gloves. Um, but and that sort of persists for a while. A lot of people that came to these places were used to going to their city parks or their 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 you know neighborhood parks or what have you. And because those were closed, they went farther away. So initially, some of those folks that came didn't have maybe the best ethics in terms of um, dealing with their waste and things of that nature. But a lot more signage. And as things started to open up, um, um, that has gotten better. So what we found just from our recent surveys the last couple of weeks is that the trash levels on our beaches, I haven't done the full analysis, but qualitatively, it looks like the trash is now back down to sort of pre-COVID levels. So, so the impacts seem to be relatively minor. But what has happened is a lot of people that maybe were going to their coastal trails have now discovered the beach. So there's a lot more people at, at the beaches um, than uh, we saw before, which is which is great, right? This is a free resource. This is something that's of everybody's heritage. And so, um, so what we're seeing now is, is, is discussions of how we're going to deal with this increased demand um, of, you know, week in, week out. More people have gone to the beach and they've said, oh, my God, this is great, and this is actually even better than or, or as good as my other outdoor recreation opportunities. So if I haven't been using the beach, I'm going to go use the beach more um, um, going forward. On air with us is environmental scientist Dr. Sean Anderson with Cal State University Channel Islands. Give us a minute on what we can do. Is there anything the average citizen can do about the uh, state of the coastline and the drought? Yeah, absolutely. I would say um, number one is um, is go enjoy it. Right? If we don't if we don't enjoy this resource, we won't think about protecting it, et cetera. So first is go enjoy it. Secondly, is enjoy it responsibly. And so you know the beach is a dynamic place. It's great. Waves come in, waves go out. Um, as long as we take a little bit of precaution, um, things go way better. What we're seeing now is much more signage, for example. Um, we, in our heavily used beaches, we have lots of garbage cans and things of that nature, but we're seeing more and more signage that says, hey, pack in, pack out, just like we are when we go camping. So don't come to the beach with all your barbecue stuff and then dump it all at the beach. Come to the beach with your barbecue stuff, barbecue, but then take that back home with you. And that would be a huge help in terms of local debris and local waste. No doubt about it. So let's talk about uh, the research that uh, you're doing there, Environmental Science Department at Cal State Channel Islands. What's going on there? What's the next project? Um, we have a bunch of projects in in the in the cook in, in the in the cooks. Man, I can't talk this morning. It's like I need some Guinness. <laughs> well, we have, we have a lot of a lot of projects in the oven. How about that, Al? In the oven. So um, one thing we just got a, a new grant um, where we are helping um, guide the state in terms of what's called out of kind mitigation. So when we, when we screw something up, we, 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 we burn down a forest or whatever, we typically we, you know, go and put a new forest in. Or if we burn down an acre of woodland, we put in an acre of woodland. Um, but sometimes we can't always do that, and so we do what's called out of kind. So maybe we don't add more trees, but maybe we um, um, uh, add more birds um, that will help grow the forest elsewhere. So, so um, there's not really good legal basis or policy guidance for that. So we're helping with, with a large group from across the state for, um, leading an effort to provide more rational guidance to the state as to how they should do that. We have, I have colleagues working on um, uh, beavers and how beavers work to um, both create more impounded waterways. This is across the West, but especially in California, impounded waterways. And then when we have these wildfires come through, those areas are less likely to burn. And when they do burn, they bounce back more quickly. We have a big study looking at how people use the coast. So using all types of data sources um, to figure out who is coming to the coast, how far away are they driving, get to the coast, et cetera. And that's helping um, inform a bunch of policy across the state. Um, we have some other folks that are doing work with uh, educators <clears throat> in Oxnard and other places, even though most of us love to go to the beach and we consider this part of our Southern California identity, um, not everybody does. And particularly our groups that from uh, lower socioeconomic groups that just don't have transportation or whatever, um, don't use these um, wonderful resources that might be in their right backyard. Um, and so we have some projects working with schools to, to bring kids and introduce them to the beach and introduce them to the coast, um, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, we have other, other projects working with the Port of Wainini, looking at the emissions and, and how we can more um, effectively uh, uh, document the, the risk of those emissions and mitigate the impact from those emissions so we can have our economic development but not be impacting our, our local communities um, as much. Dr. Sean Anderson, thank you so much for the information. Really appreciate all those great topics for this area. Kim, what's happening at the campus? 
Well, the public's invited to tune into Zoom tomorrow, Tuesday at 1 p.m. to hear an international expert on slavery in America to discuss why we celebrate Juneteenth, which was Sunday, and today's a holiday, of course. The University of Maryland professor of history, Dr. Richard Bell, is going to talk about the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which called it into slavery in the Confederate States. But the Confederacy didn't see Lincoln as their president or acknowledge the Emancipation Proclamation, so freedom had to be seized. So the angle Dr. Bell is going to discuss, which isn't discussed enough, is the measure the enslaved people had to do to free themselves before and after the Emancipation Proclamation, like burning crops, breaking tools, attacking the enslavers, and they actually forced Lincoln to take a more aggressive stance uh, with the Confederate states. You know, the, the enslaved people were doing anything they could to stop the Confederate war machine. It's fascinating. It's a heck of an opportunity. It's free. This is sponsored by Cal State Channel Island's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. To RSVP, click on csuci.edu and do a search for Juneteenth, and it should pop right up. That's Dr. Richard Bell from the University of Maryland. Thank you very much, Kim. Appreciate the information. Oh. We are News Talk 1590 KVTX.